Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. This is your girl, Yannick Taylor, a.k.a. Priestess, hostess of Conversations with the Priestess. Here's a preview of what you may hear on Conversations with the Priestess. We weren't meant for monogamy, let's be honest. Like, we have needs, let's be real. And communicating that, what you want, what you don't want, what sets up... Now, this drink is brown. Because I learned something. Since I'm older, I can't do brown liquor anymore. Also, I noticed since I started on hormone replacement there, HRT, in 2015, me and certain liquors don't match, don't match well. I don't know whether... And I recognize that a lot of men love to be dominated by women. And that's because men are seen as these leaders, as this big alpha male dominant thing, dominant being. And... Because they're put on this pedestal of being leaders, sometimes they want to be submissive. Back when I cosplayed a butch queen in South Carolina around 2011, I was on Craigslist. This is when Craigslist was bumping and before they had gotten rid of the personal section. I hope you enjoyed that preview. Join me on Wednesdays at 9 p.m. for Priestess After Dark. Full video versions of the podcast can be found on patreon.com forward slash CWT Priestess. And join me on Fridays at noon for our regular Friday post. Live, love, and be free. Smooches. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, anywhere you download and stream podcasts. All right, before we get started on this episode, I am going to thank new Patreon subscribers and read reviews on the next episode. And uh, just for Patreon subscribers, so you know, there are two episodes coming this week. The third one will be at the end of the month. Huge thank you to Jen Buchholz for putting this episode together. She uh, did the research. She is She is an absolute expert on this case. She knows it inside and out probably better than anybody out there. So huge thank you to her. And uh, I will post in the show notes all the links to take you to more information about this case as well. So here we go. Rebecca Gould was 22 years old when she was murdered on Monday, September 20th, 2004. Sometime after 8.30 a.m. and likely before noon. She was last seen in public around 8.30 a.m. at the Possum Trot Convenience Store in Melbourne, Arkansas. She purchased a breakfast sandwich, and this purchase was confirmed by the store's cashier. She was due to pick up her sister sometime that day. The accounts of when she was due for the pickup have varied, but she never arrived. She was killed that day at her boyfriend Casey McCulloch's house located near Melbourne, Arkansas. Her body was moved from the primary crime scene and was not located until seven days later at the bottom of an embankment on Route 9, also near Melbourne, Arkansas. Prior to her death, Rebecca and Casey had dated on and off for several months and lived together at his house. Significant quantities of Rebecca's blood was found in Casey's house, particularly on and around the mattress in his bedroom, the bedroom that they shared. She was struck two times in the head, shattering her nasal structure and leaving five fractures on the left side of her skull. Blunt force trauma is the general cause of death listed in her autopsy. The exact cause of death is not known, but she likely suffered extensive internal bleeding leading to the cessation of all bodily function. The manner of death was a homicide. When Rebecca's body was found, she only had a t-shirt and underwear on. There had been no attempt to bury or cover the body. Insect activity was consistent with her having been killed seven days prior and her body having laid outside in the elements for about that amount of time. 
No defensive wounds or bone bruising were found in or on her body, although there was decomposition that may have hindered the coroner's ability to detect external defensive wounds that had been on her skin. There was no evidence that she had been sexually assaulted. When police arrived at Casey's house the morning after Rebecca went missing, which was Tuesday, September 21st, 2004, they discovered a rudimentary cleanup of the crime scene. The mattress in Casey's bedroom was flipped over to hide a large blood stain, and pillows with blood on them were found stuffed under the bed. Bloody bedding was discovered in the washing machine, but law enforcement did not disclose whether this bedding had actually gone through the wash cycle. There was also a load of dried towels in the dryer. Even though someone had attempted to clean the floors, traces of blood were discovered on them as well as the baseboards and back porch. Rebecca's vehicle, purse, car keys, cell phone, clothes, and Pomeranian dog were left at Casey's house apparently untouched. The breakfast sandwich she purchased that morning at the gas station was also found uneaten. A leg from a piano that Casey owned was missing and never found, but we're not exactly sure whether or not it was collected as evidence by law enforcement or if it was just missing. This piano leg is reported to have been loose before her death and fairly easy to detach and has been suspected to have been the murder weapon, though that is totally unconfirmed. Her injuries are consistent with some style of piano legs, but are consistent with other items as well, so it's really hard telling whether it was the piano leg or something else. The Arkansas State Police has had jurisdiction over Rebecca's case since the day she was reported missing. They have released very little information with regards to what evidence they have collected from the murder scene and what the analysis of that evidence has provided. The majority of blood was found in the bedroom Casey and Rebecca shared, but we do not know the exact location of that blood. We do know there was a large blood stain on the mattress. It appears that some traces of blood were also found in the hallway of the trailer, but the exact location of that blood is also unknown. The officer who first responded to the house stated he saw what looked like blood on the back porch. It appears the killer had removed Rebecca's body via the back door, and this deduction can be made for two reasons. One, the blood on the back porch, and two, there were tire marks in the grass in the backyard. Tire track impressions could not be obtained, however, a family member has said the police were able to determine the width of the tires and the width and distance between the tire tracks. Police have never released any detailed information about the blood on the porch or the tire marks, but supposedly the tire marks indicate a smaller vehicle was used to transport her body. And it appears the piano leg from Casey's piano was definitely missing from the house. It has been rumored that Rebecca's suitcase was also missing, though police will not confirm that either. The Arkansas State Police in the past has stated that several items were missing from the home. They will not elaborate on any of this information, unfortunately. So check this out. When it comes to a lot of the evidence, we have DNA fingerprints. There was no foreign DNA or fingerprints found at the crime scene. In fact, there were not even any foreign fingerprints found on the front doorknob. If the DNA and or fingerprints of someone who was never reported to be at the house had been found, it follows that the Arkansas State Police should have made an arrest. Now since there has been no arrest, that would make us believe that there was no foreign DNA or fingerprints that were found at the crime scene. So whoever killed Rebecca would have left their DNA and or fingerprints at Casey's house. They had to touch a lot of surfaces and items in various rooms of the house, move her body, kneel down to wipe up blood off the floors, put laundry in the washer, and then probably had to wash their hands in one of the sinks. There is a very good chance they would have left traces of themselves at the scene. 
So since there was no foreign DNA or prints found, it's a pretty good indication that the killer was likely someone who resided at the house. Her boyfriend, Casey McCulloch, he claimed that video cameras at his place of work will verify his presence there for his entire shift on Monday, September 20th, 2004. However, information and corroboration from three other Sonic employees indicate that the restaurant had only one camera, which was located inside and pointed towards the front door, which would have been the door that the customers come in and out of. There was a second employee door at the back of the building which was not covered by a camera, so Casey could have easily left and returned through the back door and his movements could have never been captured on film. Therefore, his claim of alibi is impossible to prove concretely. It's, uh, it's pretty weak, it's pretty shoddy alibi. So it would almost kind of seem like he might have been involved. But for the second half of this episode, we do have Jen Buchholz, who was willing to come on and answer a few of my questions and elaborate on some of the details more. And in the show notes, also, you can go and you can follow all the links you want to all the articles that she has published on this case. She is very thorough, very detailed, super amazing. And before we uh, get to that interview in the second half of the episode... We do got to take a break and hear a word from our sponsors. Four Pillar Sports, a podcast for sports fans, made by sports fans. Join Chris and Randy every week as they dive deep into football, basketball, baseball, and professional wrestling. Catch for Pillar Sports on all major platforms. And remember, keep on talking sports. The great visionary leader of India, Mahatma Gandhi said, it is health that is real wealth and not pieces of gold and silver. Listen to the Healthy Grocer radio show on your favorite podcast platform. We know that health is our greatest wealth and we will be discussing all aspects of natural healing. Explore everything from supplements, superfoods, and healthy lifestyle choices to help conquer stress and boost productivity. Top industry experts and natural health professionals join us for a deep dive into our healing journey. You can find the Healthy Grocer Radio Show on demand every day wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And remember, health is your greatest wealth. So for me, true crime, mysteries, all that good stuff is my passion, but I do need an occasional break. When I feel like a mental palate cleanser, my go-to refresher is Best Fiends. Best Fiends is a casual game anybody can play, but it is made for adults. It's super fun, it's super awesome, you can spend as much or as little time as you like on the game. Within the first couple days I started playing it, I almost made it to level 100. Like, that's how fun it is, and you just want to keep going and going. Because once you get a routine, you get a rhythm down, you just go. I personally like to play in my off time when I'm at break at work, especially when I want to get my mind off of uh, true crime and some of the other things that I talk about. The visual aspects of this game are great, too. It's a bunch of bright colors. It's got a great design. I mean, you just use it right there on your phone. For me personally, it's the puzzles. That's what I come back for. And the characters in these games, too, are these cute little freaking bugs, you know, and then there's slugs as well. The coolest part is that it updates the game monthly with new levels, new events. It's unlike any other puzzle game out there. It just never gets old, right? Best Fiends treats the game like a service for their players. Another cool thing, too, is that it does not require the internet for you to play it. Which means you can play it while you're traveling. You play anywhere, planes, trains, and you just sit there and collect the characters. You keep on going, and you use these characters to strategically get to the next level. So if you want to engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters, trust me, with over 100 million downloads, it's a 5-star rated mobile puzzle game that is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. 
with us on this episode. I have Jen, who has put so much time into this case. And when you sent me the information, I was very, very impressed because you're like, well, what do you want? And then I told you what I wanted and I couldn't believe you typed it all up like that and everything. So a uh, huge, huge credit to Jen here. And I'm going to go ahead and let her introduce herself and um, tell you guys why she is involved in this case. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I really appreciate the coverage that you're willing to give to this case. I think it deserves it and needs it. Um, my name is Jen Buchholz. I'm an instructor of forensics and criminal justice at American Military University, and I hold master's degrees in both of those disciplines. I'm also a course developer and instructor for our State Department, where I develop and instruct law enforcement courses on investigations and surveillance. So, and then like you, I'm a military veteran. Um, I was a badged counterintelligence agent in the U.S. Army, and I worked on a lot of different types of investigations during my time in the military. So, obviously, my background is heavy in crime scene investigations, analysis, um, behavioral analysis, and even language analysis as well. So, that's, that's a short snippet of my background. How and why did you get uh, so involved in this case? Because your research is, is absolutely phenomenal, the work that you've done on it. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I actually have my editor at work um, to thank for that. She, at American Military University, we have a publishing department and instructors can write articles on, um, you know, forensic related topics, criminal justice related topics as we please. And we don't get paid for it, but it helps with our writing skills. Um, we can put on a resume that we've been published. And then sometimes it leads to situations like this where we can help a case. And so my editor actually alerted me to a podcast that had previously covered some information on Rebecca's case. And she thought I might be interested in writing an article or two about Rebecca's case. And so I started listening and I just got, I don't know, it just sucked me in. It was, I felt like there was so much analysis that could be done from a behavioral standpoint that could provide clues about Rebecca's killer. But before I wrote anything, I reached out to a journalist in Arkansas who had covered Rebecca's case since day one. He was there when her body was found and his name is George Jared. And I thought, well, let me see if I can get him on the phone and if he'll talk to me to give me a little more insight on his experience with the case because I had read many articles he wrote. And so I emailed him and he called me almost immediately and we ended up talking on the phone for like three hours that night. And so that's how I got started down this path. And so I started looking at the case and I wrote my first one or two articles on it. And then I was writing my third one and I was going to do some analysis on the way her body was disposed of and where. And I thought, I need to see this in person. Uh, looking at maps isn't doing it. And so my husband came home from work that night. I go, do you want to take a road trip to Arkansas? And he's always up for an adventure. And he's like, yeah, let's go. And so, and so we planned a trip for like the next weekend. And we made plans to meet up with George. And then George also put me in touch with Rebecca's father. So we traveled to Arkansas, which I'm so glad we did because seeing the um, location of the murder scene in relation to where Rebecca's body was found, really opened my eyes. Like it gave, a, it, I felt it gave me new clues into her case. And then also that weekend, me, George, my husband and Rebecca's father met up and we had a very long meeting. We were together probably five or six hours nice. um, going over the case and what law enforcement had or hadn't done and kind of giving them my thoughts and just, you know, brainstorming on what could be done. And so at this time, I'm like, I can't just let it go. So I just kept writing articles. I've written about 10 articles, I think, on the case. And then, of course, as articles started getting published, people started messaging me. And that was another reason where I said, I can't just walk away from this because some of the people messaging me have firsthand information. And this could be really crucial. Yeah, for sure. And so that's how I got started. <laughs> that's the long story, but that's how I got started down this road. That's the kicker you know a lot of people don't understand sometimes they're more willing to talk to somebody who's not law enforcement than yes. somebody who is you know yes i've i definitely find that to be true in some cases 
I, I did mention the autopsy, but I also mentioned that you have some more in-depth analysis on the autopsy. Can you touch on that for us a little bit? Sure. So one of the documents Rebecca's father provided me was the full autopsy report. It has never been um, published, or the, in its entirety, it's never been provided to the public, and I will not do that either. Um, there are certain details in that report that I will not reveal because I think that they're important for law enforcement to kind of, you know, keep to themselves. Um, but what I did was a real critical analysis on Rebecca's injuries. And to do that, I got my friend who's an ER trauma nurse, a registered nurse, and she worked ER trauma, and she was also a firefighter and paramedic for many, many years. So she's seen every injury you can imagine. And she and I went through the autopsy report. We spent hours combing through it uh, word by word, basically, because there's so much medical terminology that I didn't know. And she was such a great help. And she actually ended up deciphering the whole autopsy report and breaking it down for me and then drawing me sketches of Rebecca's injuries, which we realized a previous sketch that had been done by another so-called investigator was completely wrong. And so that was really eye-opening. But basically what it comes down to is Rebecca was hit two separate times in the head. I believe the first hit shattered her, I know, I know one of the hits shattered her nose her entire nasal structure to the point where pieces of the bone couldn't even be found at autopsy. That was that severe. Um, there was another hit to the left side of her head, which caused five fractures on that side of the head. We strongly believe that the first hit shattered her nose and then the second hit um, was delivered to the left side of her head and that probably rendered her unconscious and she probably never woke up from that. What I hate about it is that she could have been saved. Whoever did this could have called 911 and she could have lived, but instead they chose to let her die um, because she did not die instantly. Neither one of those injuries would kill you instantly. Um, your, your body would still be alive for, at a minimum, several minutes, maybe even an hour. What are we thinking for a possible murder weapon? Well, based on the description of the two blows and the injuries to her nose and head, it almost had to be something cylindrical, um, like round in shape and not really wide. So like a two by four would not be consistent with either injury. Um, it would have to be something smaller. So the best example I've come up with that's most consistent to me is a tire checker. And I don't know if, I didn't know what a tire checker was before this case. But what a tire checker is, they're carried by truckers and they thump, it's also called a tire thumper sometimes, but they'll thump the tires on their semi and it delivers a specific sound to let them know if their tires are aired up properly. And these can be found at you know any truck stop. I mean, I've, bu I've bought several actually now. And it's, a, it's just a common tool that truckers carry and it's also a common tool that truckers often use in their home as a self-defense weapon. A lot of them will keep one by their door. We have several friends actually who drive trucks for a living and I talk to all of them and um, all but one keep a tire checker in their house as a potential self-defense weapon. And you can do research on the use of tire checkers um, that have been used by people in the past as a weapon. And so I think that's one of the most likely weapons or objects that could have been the weapon that was used to hit Rebecca. But there are others as well. There was a missing piano leg from the trailer where she was killed. The missing piano leg was reportedly discovered by her boyfriend, who was a resident of that trailer, after police had processed the scene. He reportedly alerted police that this leg off of his piano is missing. Police have never confirmed or denied whether they think the piano leg was the weapon. Um, it's just speculation because it's missing. If somebody would tell me the shape of that piano leg or show me a picture, I could tell you right away whether it was the weapon or not. But um, the boyfriend won't give up that information, nor will the police. So we're left, okay. we're left to wonder for now. So speaking of her boyfriend, why is he such a huge person of interest? Maybe you can get a little bit more in depth on that. In the beginning, he was 
I guess a suspect or person of interest. I mean, he had to be questioned. He's the most logical suspect mm-hmm. when your girlfriend's killed in your home. It's just, that's just how a police investigation goes. The residents of the home and the people closest to the victim are going to be questioned first. Um, he took great offense at being the suspect. And it's, I mean, it's of course uncomfortable to be questioned about a murder, but it's like, well, um, it's, this is the natural progression of an investigation. <laughs> and if you didn't do it, you shouldn't be offended. Yeah. Um, you should want to help. But anyways, he was cleared very quickly. Like my understanding from one news report is he was cleared before Rebecca's body was even found. Mm. And I don't know how that's possible, but that's what one news report said. And I think part of that may have been because there was a false sighting of Rebecca on late Monday afternoon. And so I think police were going off that sighting initially thinking that she was alive late into Monday, when in reality, she was probably killed Monday morning. And so they may have inadvertently ruled him out or incorrectly ruled him out based on that. But just because you get ruled out once doesn't mean you can't become a suspect again. And then also, he and his family members and even one of the investigators have always claimed that Casey had a solid alibi, that he was at work um, Monday from approximately 8 a.m. to 1 or 2 p.m., we think. And then he stayed there at work until his friends got off. And then they all went to another town to run errands, to go to a movie, to eat dinner. And then he slept at a friend's house overnight. And so, but that's not a solid alibi at all. There's no video of him at work. Um, There may be a time card that says he arrived at 8 a.m., but a time card doesn't mean that the person actually showed up at that time. You know, somebody could easily clock you in. But there's no video of him at work. There's no video of him in the afternoon hanging around at work, staying there. There may be video of him in the evening when they went to see the movie. But after that, there's no video of him at his friend's house overnight. So there's many, many hours of that day where there's no solid alibi at all. So it's almost laughable that anybody claimed that. Probably ask you a motive here next. I mean, a motive, we don't know for sure. There's always, you know, a jealousy factor. Most likely, Rebecca died as a result someone losing their temper in an emotional rage. Um, that, th- that's what everything points to in this case. Um, this wasn't premeditated. Um, it was not planned out. Uh, there was a cleanup afterwards, which was shoddy and incomplete and not well done. Um, the whole thing just indicates that the killer did not mean to kill her and did not intend to have to, in a panic, clean up a crime scene. So the emotional rage part of course, indicates that her killer was somebody that she knew and somebody that she probably knew well and that somebody she probably got in a fight with just prior to her death. So that right there probably limits or reduces the number of suspects in the case. And unfortunately, when you have a boyfriend and you die in his home, you know, there's a motive right there that they argued over something. Mm -hmm. Um, We don't know what. And that he lost his cool and grab something, a weapon of opportunity, and hit her. I I don't know a specific motive, but I would have to guess that it has something to do with infidelity, or maybe she was leaving him, or maybe he found out that she was seeing somebody else or talking to another guy. So because of his pretty shoddy alibi, that's why the cops wrote him off so quick. So who was there, other people of interest, who were other suspects involved? Mm -hmm. Why were they ruled out, or not ruled out for that matter? Um, Law enforcement has never provided any information to the public on why any person was specifically ruled out, in or out, as a suspect. So we don't know what anybody's alibi is. So it's hard for me to be specific on that. But what I can say is that Rebecca's ex-boyfriend was looked at as a suspect. The woman he was dating at the time was looked at as a suspect, as was a member of her family. So there was, my understanding, there was four main suspects, Casey, Rebecca's ex, the ex's girlfriend, and that girlfriend's family member. Um, Down the road over time, a couple more people came into the picture as potential persons of interest, but, you know, nobody's ever been arrested and nobody's ever been named as a suspect. Yeah, and even though Casey does have an alibi, some of the evidence surrounding him seems pretty compelling. One of the most compelling things to me is that 
I am almost certain that they did not find any foreign DNA or fingerprints or fibers at that trailer. Because if they had found, say, the DNA of Rebecca's ex-boyfriend, I mean, he would have been arrested because he should have never been at that trailer. He stated he never he had never been there. So if his DNA or prints are found there, he's obviously lying. And to me, the fact that nobody's ever been arrested from, well, arrested at all, but specifically anybody outside the McCullough family tells me there was probably no DNA or prints from anybody outside their family or from anybody who should not have ever been at that trailer. And part of the trouble with this case may be that they have the DNA imprints of several members of the McCullough family and they can't prove which one actually picked up the weapon and hit her. Police have not confirmed whether or not it's actually Rebecca's blood that was found. Correct. Is there what makes sense as to why they won't confirm or deny that? They had just been so tight-lipped on this case from the very beginning. Since her body was found. They've never given a news conference. They've never provided a public update. There's been a couple interviews done that by you know journalists in the area, but the information provided from investigators was pretty vague, and most of it was just a refusal to confirm or deny anything um, because it might affect the case in the long run. Okay. And so we're operating on very little information or very little credible information or facts. We don't know 100% that it was Rebecca's blood found in that house. Logically, it probably was. I mean, who else, you know, lost that much blood in that trailer that we know of? Nobody else. So yeah. um, it, it most certainly was her blood. But the cops will not provide us any crime scene photos um, or even a description of, like, where the blood was found. We only know that there was blood found on the mattress, I believe, in the room where Casey and Rebecca slept. So I would call it Casey's mattress. But again, I don't even know that for 100%. But there was blood found on a mattress and there was blood on his back deck indicating that her body was carried out of the house or drug out of the house via that back door. In the backyard, which um, was reportedly kind of grown up with either weeds or grass, there was evidence that a vehicle had um, driven in there up to the back porch. However, there was no tire impressions in the dirt or soil that could be collected, from my understanding. Um, it was a very dry time of year, so there hadn't been any rain, so that most likely there was no tire impressions. However, um, it does sound like that they were able to measure at least the width between the tires on the left and right side of that vehicle, which I would hope gives law enforcement a clue or would help them rule in some vehicles or some out as being potential vehicles that were used to transport her body. But, I mean, really beyond that and the missing piano leg, we have hardly any confirmation of anything else So, uh, what the crime scene looked like. So touching on that, what are your thoughts on the investigation past and present? The past investigation infuriates <laughs> me. In the I beginning, it, it did appear that law enforcement was making a great effort to solve this case, but then it languished. One issue in the beginning, and this is not the investigator's fault, but the crime lab took over a year to analyze the evidence and get those results back to investigators. So that may have affected their, you know, their ability to question the correct people or something. It's also possible that some of the evidence was damaged or destroyed or unusable, but we don't know that for sure. That's just um, one speculation. But after that first year or so, I mean, it just went quiet. Um, it just didn't seem like much was being done. Like I said, they never gave any news conferences or a public update. They would not even update Rebecca's own father. They would not tell him anything. Um, he tried for years to get a meeting with the DA, Don McSpadden, and was always refused. It just never happened. He still has never met with any DA who would oversee this case if it went to court. And that to me is just inexcusable. This is a murder victim's father who ended up spending a lot of his own money to hire private investigators and such to try to solve this case. I, he deserves some sort of update, you know, periodically. I really, I firmly believe that. Yeah, agree. And then we, we ran into, or they ran into a bigger problem over the years where the main investigator assigned to the case just had what I call confirmation bias. 
which is he believed that Rebecca's killer was a certain person from the local area and he was just fixated on that one person and that's it. And I mean, I have actual proof of him basically obstructing justice and refusing to listen to new information or evidence that I provided him and refusing offers of assistance from outsiders who have relevant experience. And when I say that, I'm not talking about myself. I'm mm -hmm. talking about, I actually got in touch with the retired FBI agent who caught the Unabomber and we email and he put forth an invitation for the Arkansas State Police to present Rebecca's case in front of the VDOC Society, which is a oh, nonprofit yeah. organization. You've probably heard of them, right? Yes, yes, nonprofit made... organization. Yes. Made up of these world renowned experts like people who caught the Unabomber. Um, and they meet every month and agencies from around the world are on a waiting list to present cases mm -hmm. that they can't solve. And the VDOC Society has a great track record of yeah. success in helping these agencies. The ASP turned down that invitation. I mean, it's oh, ridiculous. Wow. wow. Uh, and I finally got the investigator on the phone and I'm like, could you just explain to me why you guys decided not to take that invitation? And he says, we're not going to present Rebecca's case to a bunch of civilians. Oh, those are civilians. Oh, exactly. Oh, so, they, uh, the only reason I know who they are is because they, uh, they actually picked up a case out of uh, south of Indianapolis here. And one of their big things was they had the local police actually release more information than they had previously released. And that was one of the very first things they did. But they, they are hardly a group of civilians. That's Not at all. It's the weakest excuse. Uh, I mean, <laughs> and it's embarrassing. And so I went back to this FBI agent and I told him, and I mean, he was astounded. I mean, he, and he was offended and I don't blame him. He yeah. said, okay, so here's what you do. He says, here's the number to the behavioral analysis unit at Quantico. They are all badged current FBI agents. They are not <laughs> civilians. They all have top secret clearance. <laughs> they can, the ASP can request their assistance in this case. And so I passed that information on to the investigator. And all I said was like, oh, thanks. I already know the, the FBI agents down at the Little Rock office or something like that. And that was the last we ever heard about it. Sounds like somebody's um, got a little bit too much pride there. Something. I do believe there's a lot of law enforcement ego that played a role in this case the yeah. good thing is there is a positive end to this or side of this is that there's a new investigator on the case and he appears to be doing his job he acknowledges and accepts information we send him he tracks down leads some other actions that i'm not going to divulge publicly but sure. he appears to be diligently working this case and wanting to solve it so that gives us a lot of hope and he's actually, he communicates, I can talk to him. So he's a breath of fresh air and, and ho we're just, you know, hoping, hoping that he can bring this to an end. Why did they uh, switch investigators? We don't know. I, I don't know. I hope well. someday to find out. Um, we kind of suspect it's because of all the public pressure um, yeah. that was we're, being put out on the bad press. Because people weren't doing their fucking job. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually met with the FBI last year when I was in Arkansas and I put together this huge binder of information and Rebecca's father and I went down to the Little Rock office and provided them that binder and sat with them for a good hour and a half or two hours going through everything. And, um, you know, when we got there, I said immediately to the agent, I said, I know that you guys can't take jurisdiction of the murder aspect of this case, but what we're asking for is for you to look into the mishandling of this case by the ASP because and I had a whole list. Here's all the indicators that there's either corruption or cover up or something going on. And so maybe that finally had some influence. The case has gotten press in the last few months. And yeah. I actually typed up a maybe one page letter that I sent to every news station in Arkansas explaining like what the problem with this case, how we can't get any answers, the investigator is ignoring information, stuff like that. So maybe putting that letter out <laughs> had a little influence in that too, but we don't honestly know why after 14 years they put a new investigator on it, but we're just thrilled that it was done. Why does the state police have jurisdiction over it, not local? 
So the sheriff's department was the one that responded when Rebecca went missing. Her mother called in for a welfare check after she had not shown up to pick up her sister. And so the sheriff's department sent a deputy to Casey's trailer to do a welfare check. He took Casey with him. The two of them went through the house. When the officer went around back, he saw the blood on the back porch. And so then he went back in the house and started a more thorough examination of the scene and realized that there was blood in more places. And so he called the sheriff who came out. And then that first day, the sheriff decided that they just weren't equipped to handle that level of a murder. Okay. And so he called in the ASP and they took jurisdiction immediately. Well, I mean, I can I can respect the fact when a when a department realizes, you know, they're not equipped to handle something like that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Melbourne's such a tiny town. I mean, I don't know how many other murders they've had, but it's not something they deal with and they don't have a crime lab and all that. So his decision made complete sense. Yeah, you know, sure. tons of other agencies have done the same thing in the same position. So that decision yeah. was not an issue. It was just how the ASP moved forward with it. Yeah, I've seen cases to where those small departments will still not hand it over to a bigger one mm-hmm. for That's true. Cert, you know, certain reasons. And, it, and it, it eventually hurts the investigation overall because time is a factor and things like this. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously we're going on, what, 15, 16 years now? 15 and a half years, yes. Yep. It's pretty troubling. But your work on this case is pretty invaluable. I mean, I, mean, I love you... to write anyways. And so... And I love to analyze stuff. <laughs> so it's it's not like it's been any sort of a chore. I mean, it's I don't want to say investigating a murder is ever enjoyable, but I feel like I do have some decent there's skills that, that I can yeah, bring to the sense. table. Exactly, exactly. And you're definitely qualified to actually look into something like that more than, you know, a random person would be for sure. But I've been accused of doing this for money and fame, even though oh, <laughs> not, I don't make one dollar doing any of this. Like I've spent thousands out of my own pocket. But oh, you're you're talking to a podcaster who gets those same yeah. same emails. Why oh yeah, exactly. Right. This? And it's like I'm not trying to get the word out because correct nobody correct. said anything about it for 20 years. You know exactly. I mean, we're doing this like with a positive purpose in mind, you know, it's not for ourselves. Exactly. We're trying to help somebody else. And quite frankly, if I was bludgeoned to death and thrown in a ditch, like I would want someone out there working for me. So I, I just look at it from the victim's point of view and they deserve some justice. Right. You know, even a bigger issue, it's a public safety issue. When you have a murderer walking free, you have no idea if that person's going to murder again. It's literally a public safety issue. That's very true. Yeah. So with the new investigator, you guys, uh, meaning you and, and family and everybody else involved, you're pretty happy with the current state and where the case is possibly heading? As happy as we can be, yeah. I mean, we're like, we want to know exactly what's going on, but we understand that we can't. So patience is a virtue, and some days it's really hard to be patient, but yeah. all indications are that this new investigator is doing his job correctly. and. So we have faith that hopefully, you know, one of these days we'll we'll wake up one morning and have messages about an arrest being made. Can you tell everybody where they can find more information about this case? Any links and some of your information? If they want to read my articles, and I don't know if you have listener notes maybe for the yes, episode, yes. But I could give you the link. But um, there's just one link that will take you to all my articles on Rebecca's case if they want to read that. It's through American Military University, and it's through their online, basically, magazine that they published, and it's called In Public Safety. So if they Google In Public Safety with my name, they can also find my articles. Um, and then also, so George, the journalist, and I, we we are admins of a Facebook group that's dedicated to getting justice for Rebecca and the name of our group is Unsolved Murder of Rebecca Gould and we welcome anybody to join. Um, We really try to hold critical discussions where maybe we can come up with new ideas on the page. Um, We try to keep it drama free. That's not always possible, but but we do our best to keep people on track. And um, we don't moderate. So this is kind of a pact we made. We want everybody to feel comfortable speaking their mind. And we understand that some people aren't going to agree with others' opinions. And that's fine. But we don't moderate comments. Um, anybody who becomes a member can post as they want. Um, 
I've only had to remove one, one or two posts so far that got extremely offensive and out of line. But for the most part, we don't remove comments or posts. You know, we want people to speak their minds and we want to hear differing points of view. So we welcome people to join that one. And then there's a second group run by a woman in Arkansas named Kim and her group is called Who Murdered Rebecca Gould? So either group or both groups, people are welcome to join and we'd love to have more members so we can keep this going and get people interested. And you never know what little tidbit might be the breaking point. <clears throat> yeah, that's absolutely true. As soon as I get back, uh, I'm on a Facebook break right now. And as soon as I get back on here, probably uh, the beginning of June, I'll be, I'll be joining those. For sure. Fantastic. To try to keep that would up be great. With some info and stuff and share info and all that good yeah. stuff. Yeah. So those are yep. the two main avenues I have for people to learn more. Okay. Is there anything you would like to say in closing? There's many things I'd like to say, but I'll keep it short. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's time for whoever did this to just give it up. Um, you're, you know, you've, you've had your freedom for 15 years. If you want to call it that, they're probably not totally free at least not of their own mental pressure, but just give it up. Let's, you know, things happen. We understand that, you know, arguments escalate sometimes. They should never escalate to murder, but things do happen. And I'm betting the person, if they just come forward and let it out to the investigators, <laughs> they're going to relieve the, themselves of a big burden. Um, and anybody else who's harboring these secrets, because I'm confident that there are multiple people that know exactly what happened and are not saying anything. And so shame on them as well. Um, they're just as culpable in a murder if they don't come forward. That's pretty much it. Um, people can always email me. I have an email set up just for anonymous tips and that's tips at justiceforrebecca.com. And the four is the letter for um, anything sent to me stays confidential. Um, sometimes I do have to share information with the investigator, but that's it. I don't share names and I don't publicize what anybody tells me so awesome. somebody hears this even if you just want to brainstorm with me send me a message um, I answer all my messages um, but if you have a tip or something that you want reported but you don't want your name given to investigators not a problem send it to me on that email and I'll forward it on outstanding and thank you again Jen for taking the time out to talk to us and you know give us a little bit more detail on on some of the aspects of the case Absolutely. Thank you for taking this on and for, for doing an episode on it. I, oh, no I greatly, greatly appreciate it. <laughs> no problem at all. Perfect. Well, I really, really thank you. <laughs> no, that's no problem at all. Thank you for making the time to, to come on sure. here and talk to me about this. Anytime. And if you have follow-up questions later, just shoot me an email or give me a ring. I w oh, I'm sure I will. I'm sure I will. People can follow you on Twitter, correct? At Jen Buchholz, P.I. For private investigator outstanding and you guys can all follow her on there tweet to her ask her questions she is more than definitely. willing to answer all questions for sure about definitely. this case and like the more brains working on this and thinking about this the better so i welcome absolutely. anybody that wants to brainstorm absolutely agree and all right i suppose on that note i will uh talk to you i'll be in touch jen and talk to you later okay great thank you so much have a good afternoon thank you you too all right, take care.